Path of the Pole by Charles Hapgood. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons and monsters and serpents. This is Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, and we are coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of science where we are nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Everest Plateau and I am once again risking life, limb, and health to come down here into this den of sickness. What? <laughs> Podcast. <laughs> hey man, I'm not contagious. <laughs> because Kyle's family has children, they... Sometimes the entire family comes down with some kind of sickness, and I still have to come down here. Yeah, it always goes through everybody. Yeah. Kids get it. Next <laughs> thing I know, I'm feeling it. And <laughs> Laura's got it. It's all... Uh. And I risk my life yeah, to come yeah, down yeah. here and podcast <laughs> during these times. <laughs> no, it was real bad. Uh, was it Friday or Thursday? No, yeah, yeah. You, it was whatever bad the for meeting you. was, I, I was like, I had fever. I had to just yeah. come home and go to sleep. Yep, Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah, so I found out I have really narrow nasal passages. Abnormally narrow. And uh, my sinuses can't drain very good, so i just prone to uh, sinus infections. Yep. Well, at least we're figuring, you're figuring out what's wrong. Yeah. That's why am I, why do I get sick so much? Yeah. So we've gotten some uh, feedback on the new format. Uh, I can characterize them. It's basically two categories. One is, what the hell are you doing? Put it back the way it was. And two is, I always thought I wanted it this way, but now that you're doing it, I realize I hate it. Please put it back. (laughs) So all I'm going to say is just stick with us. Think of this as a trial. We're not necessarily doing this forever, but for this book report, we're going to try it this way. And it's it's really to help new listeners like you guys. All yeah, of you, stop being so selfish. <laughs> all of you guys are are used to us, and and the you know you've gotten to know us or whatever. But new listeners, it's harder for them to get through that that material in the first segment when they don't know us. So putting it at the end can help new listeners sort of grow into the show. So we're just trying it out. It isn't a permanent change, but just stick with us for now. Well, he's not telling you the real reason we made the change which Just was workout guy because we wanted <laughs> we wanted more complaining <laughs> The complaining had waned, and and it was just you know it was all warm and fuzzies everywhere, and we were like, well, what the hell's going on? Yeah, let's let's change, let's make let's do something that they'll hate, so we can get some more complaining. Yeah, that's okay. really what we were after. <laughs> it's working brilliantly. <laughs> yeah, plan succeeded. So, um, still tackling Path of the Pole by Charles Hapgood, and like I like to do with these books, read the multiple forwards one at a time. So this one, actually what we're going to do here, uh, this is going to be two of them. Well, three really, because there's a, there is a forward to the forwards written by the author for the second edition of the book, talking about the forwards for the first edition of the book. Wow. So that's what we're going through today. So another one by the author, this is from the author, but then we're going to read the forwards for the first edition from Einstein and, and the, and the geologist guy. So from the author, Uh, Hapgood says, the most significant change in this book since Albert Einstein wrote his foreword for the American edition and Professor Kurtley Mather wrote one for the British, Spanish, and Italian editions is directly related to the question on which they both expressed their strongest doubts. The ice cap mechanism by which I propose to account for displacements of the Earth's outer shell. Their doubts have been vindicated by the progress of Earth studies in the past decade. Advancing knowledge of conditions of the Earth's crust now suggest that the forces responsible for shifts of the crust lie at some depth within the Earth rather than on its surface. Despite this change in the character of the proposed explanation of the movements, the evidence for the shifts themselves have been multiplied many-fold in the past decade. The main themes of the book, the occurrence of the crust displacements even very recently in geological history, and their effects in forming the features of the Earth's surface, therefore, remain unchanged. Okay, so forward to the first edition. This is from, by, by Kurtley F. Mather, or uh, Mather, maybe. 
professor of geology emeritus, Harvard University. The idea that the history of the Earth involves the shifting of its thin crust from time to time and place to place is certain to receive increased attention in the next few years. Knowledge is rapidly accumulating concerning the spatial relations of the crust and the underlying mantle. Information regarding the physical properties of these parts of the stratiform planet is being secured by geophysicists. Many specific facts are now available concerning local changes of level and of geographic position of points on the Earth's surface. The geologic records of the past are replete with items that suggest significant differences between the latitude and longitude of many places in earlier epochs and those of the present time. The need is clearly apparent for a synthesis of all these many data that would integrate them in a broadly inclusive scheme and give them unified meaning in relation to a general principle. In geology, indeed in all scientific disciplines, analysis must lead to synthesis, which in turn must be followed by further an analytical studies in the repetitive cycles of advancing knowledge and understanding. This is evidently the aim of this thought-provoking book. Its greatest value will be found in the stimulus it should give to discussion, to debate, and controversial argument. The concept of crustal shifting as an important and frequently repeated episode in Earth history is not new, but the marshalling of data from many diverse fields of study and their interpretation in casual terms are sufficiently novel to make the author's ideas worthy of careful study and appraisal. Indeed, certain aspects of their application of the general concept are radically new and will undoubtedly lead to healthy controversy. I cannot, for example, accept as valid certain interpretations made by the authors of some of the facts they cite, but these are minor matters and do not necessarily invalidate their major argument. My own confidence in the principle of isostasy leads me, moreover, to discount the computation of tangential forces resulting from off-center ice caps, but this is certainly a matter for further study. The results of geophysical research must accord with the facts of Earth history if they are to be accepted as completely trustworthy. All of which means that the authors of this novel, of this novel interpretation of crustal movements, have made a distinctive contribution to geological lore, which should be of interest to all geologists. The numerous unsolved problems to which Mr. Hapgood directs attention should be the subjects of intensified debate among scientists in every part of the world. It should, moreover, be noted that this book is written in clear, non-technical language. Mr. Hapgood has succeeded in bringing the thought within the reach of every educated layman. It is a readable survey of geological problems that too long have been the province of specialists alone. Curtly F. Mather, July 1st, 1959. That's cool. So is he suggesting that in the part about isostasy that he doesn't like the idea of like off-center ice caps because they would be pushed down? Yeah, that like offsets the their tendency to have a an effect that would yeah, pull Yeah, because if the, it comes closer to the center right. of the planet then it doesn't have as much uh, angular that's momentum. right exactly yeah uh, and and hapgood is his forward to these forwards is acknowledging that yeah, yeah, yeah. and saying that this book the one we're reading is is correcting that those issues because right. he eventually over time in correspondence with einstein and others came to agree yeah so forward to the first edition by albert einstein i frequently receive communications from people who wish to consult me concerning their unpublished ideas it goes without saying that these ideas are very seldom possessed of scientific validity. <laughs> the very first communication, however, that I received from Mr. Hapgood electrified me. His idea is original, of great simplicity, and, if it continues to prove itself, of great importance to everything that is related to the history of the Earth's surface. A great many empirical data indicate that at each point on the Earth's surface that has been carefully studied, many climatic changes have taken place, apparently quite suddenly. This, according to Hapgood, is explicable if the virtually rigid outer crust of the Earth undergoes from time to time extensive displacement over the viscous, plastic, possibly fluid inter inner layers. Such displacements may take place as the consequence of comparatively slight forces exerted on the crust derived from the Earth's momentum of rotation, which in turn will tend to alter the axis of rotation of the Earth's crust. In a polar region, there is continual deposition of ice, which is not symmetrically distributed around the pole. 
The Earth's rotation acts on these unsymmetrically deposited masses and produces centrifugal momentum that is transmitted to the rigid crust of the Earth. The constantly increasing centrifugal moment momentum produced in this way will, when it has reached a certain point, produce a movement of the Earth's crust over the rest of the Earth's body, and this will displace the polar regions towards the equator. Without a doubt, the Earth's crust is strong enough not to give way proportionately as the ice is deposited. The only doubtful assumption is that the Earth's crust can be moved easily enough over the inner layers. The author has not confined himself to a simple, simple presentation of this idea. He has also set forth, cautiously and comprehensively, the extraordinarily rich material that supports his displacement theory. I think that this rather astonishing and even fascinating idea deserves the serious attention of anyone who concerns himself with the theory of the Earth's development. To close with an observation that has occurred to me while writing these lines, if the Earth's crust is really so easily displaced over its substratum as this theory requires, then the rigid masses near the Earth's surface must be distributed in such a way that they give rise to no other considerable centrifugal momentum, which would tend to displace the crust by centrifugal effect. I think that this deduction might be capable of verification at least approximately. This centrifugal momentum should, in any case, be smaller than that produced by the masses of deposited ice. So again, there, he's pointing out. It, he's not saying it, but... He's basically saying that, you know, if there's any changes that can lessen that, you know, which would be isostasy, I think is what the first guy was okay. saying. So those are the two intros to the book written for the 59 edition. So back to where we were at the end of last episode, and we were, we had just gotten to the part where we uh, talked about oceanographer Bruce Heason, who discovered a number of serious difficulties with the ocean floor spreading hypothesis. And then you demanded that I read more, and I said no. <laughs> <laughs> so, part eight, Heason's difficulties. Heason notes first that in the Atlantic, the rock formations at the continental slopes on both sides of the ocean do not bend down, but rather break off abruptly as if some terrific force had cracked the continental block and pulled the pieces apart. This is, of course, in accordance with the sea floor spreading hypothesis. However, it dismayed him to find the same thing on the Pacific coast of North America. He considers this contradictory to the hypothesis because, according to it, America has been moving westward into the Pacific, where there is no continental block and where no land mast was torn apart. A, seven, a second difficulty that occurs to him is that if the Atlantic Ocean is a recently formed rift ocean, only a couple of hundred million years old, then Europe and Asia must have been moving eastward as America moved westward. Asia must therefore be encroaching on the Pacific. It seems to follow from this that the Pacific Ocean must be much older than the Atlantic. Accordingly, there should be, he suggests, thicker deposits of sediments on its bottom than on the Atlantic Ocean. Instead, he finds the sediments on the floor of the Pacific are similar in type and quantity to those on the floor of the Atlantic. On the other hand, if the Pacific Ocean floor has been spreading from the mid-Pacific ridge in the same way as the Atlantic floor, and the Pacific is also a rift ocean, as some enthusiasts now claim, then the difficulties are only increased. Heason points out that, according to the theory, the world encircling Rift Canyon as it broadens with the intrusion of new matter from below is inevitably pushing the different segments of the Earth's crust against one another. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge is pushing America in one direction, while the Mid-Pacific Ridge is pus pushing it in precisely the opposite direction. And it seems that this amounts to a battle between the two ridges. Which will win? And what will happen to the continent itself and to the seafloors caught in between? Obviously, something has to give. It might be argued that the folding of the Rockies and the Andes might represent a yielding of the continents to such pressure. But why are there not similar mountain ranges on all coasts? There are no coastal mountain ranges on either the western or eastern coasts of the Atlantic, nor on most of the coasts of the Indian Ocean, which has its own mid-oceanic ridge, nor on the coasts of Australia, nor on the northern coasts of North America and Asia. Coastal mountain ranges are indeed exceptional on the face of the Earth. So Heason observes that the 40,000-mile-long mid-oceanic ridge curls and twists all over the globe. 
if along its whole length, convection currents are rising to crack the lithosphere, then these currents would have to be very long sausage shaped affairs, hard to visualize. And where are they sinking? The mid oceanic ridge is highly active seismically and gives evidence of a high heat flow from the interior facts which agree with the assumption that convection currents are rising under the ridge, but Heason points out that corresponding areas where the currents should be sinking ought to show equal seismicity and heat flow deficit. But there is little evidence that the currents are sinking at the borders of continents or under them, as the theory requires. Oxburgh and Turncoat, uh, or... Yeah, turncoat, have shown that the areas on the Earth's surface where the geological facts are consistent with the assumption of sinking convection currents are not nearly so extensive as the mid-oceanic ridge system. There is at present no sort of balance between them. Heason also points out evidence of two kinds that appear to contradict the assumption that the ocean floors are involved in convection cells. He mentions first the great system of faults on the ocean bottoms, which suggest that great slabs of the ocean floor have been displaced laterally relative to one another for distances of hundreds of miles. This cracking of the ocean floor suggests that they are in fact rigid plates, which could not be carried along by convection currents moving under the lithosphere. He views as further evidence of the strength of the ocean floors the existence of innumerable mountains called seamounts scattered on the floors of all the oceans which have not sunk into the mantle despite their frequently enormous mass and weight. So if it was like a weak very uh, thin ocean floor, then the isostasy would be much more rapid, so mountains would just sink down. Right. Very interesting. <clears throat> That's cool. Yeah. So, part nine, his solution. In view of this cataract of difficulties... What does Heason propose? He suggests an entirely new mechanism to account for the lithospheres being pulled apart so that new ocean bottom may be formed. He suggests that the Earth is growing, that it has expanded enormously throughout geological time. This idea is naturally full of difficulties and perhaps raises much more serious problems than it solves. And we shall soon see, however, that it is not necessary. A far simpler solution exists. There you go. Expanding Earth. Okay. <laughs> that is weird. I wonder what the simpler solution is. Um, the you... simpler solution is Hapgoods. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well. And we're going to be, yeah, we'll be getting into it. Uh, and I just want to say that as I'm going through this book more and more, it's reminding me more and more of what I loved so much about Velikovsky's Earth and Upheaval. As at once you get past this beginning, which is it's still good, the beginning where he's sort of laying out the broader problems, then he begins to just list geological data. Like, yeah, look yeah, at this yeah. weird fact. Look at this thing yeah, that's yeah, unexplained. Yeah, yeah. And it's just over just one after the other. Anomalies, right? That haven't been explained. Now, clearly, again, we're looking at it through the past. You know, the most recent edition of this book is the 70s, and then a lot of the information is from the 50s, but still it's it's still valid, and I think a lot of these questions still exist today. So it's it's really great. Sweet. So part 10, further objections to seafloor spreading. Some oceanographers have found evidence that to them seems inconsistent with the assumptions of seafloor spreading. Douglas J. Elvers finds objections to the conveyor belt mechanism in much evidence derived from a study of magnetic anomalies in the floor of the Pacific. A magnetic anomaly is a deviation from the normal strength of the Earth's magnetic field caused apparently by differences in the strengths or conflicts in the directions of magnetization of the rocks underlying, in this case, the ocean floor. The study covered an area of more than 400,000 square miles. Elvers suggests that the findings of the survey would require, quote, a mechanism that could form the lineation patterns in situ in the Pacific Ocean crust. This mechanism requires the existence of a crustal plate fractured by regional stresses. Igneous material would then be injected into the fracture patterns, forming a mega dike swarm, unquote. I should also mention that for the most part, every one of these quotes that Hapgood gives and a lot of the times where he just he just says, here's what science has shown. There are links to the extensive bibliography at the end of the book. Okay. He's not making an outrageous claim. Right. <laughs> He's just, you know, linking you to other people's outrageous claims. 
So we shall see shortly that polar wandering can provide a solution for this problem as well as for Heason's dilemmas. Watkins and Richardson find that data from the mid-Atlantic ridge are not in agreement with the hypothesis of seafloor spreading. And they complain rather bitterly that geophysicists at present, because of their enthusiasm for this theory, are forcing the evidence to fit it. So I quote their abstract in full, despite the fact that it concerns technicalities that do not concern us. Quote, The desirability of accurate deline delineations of areas of active crustal spreading is the motive for presentation of arguments against unrestricted application of the crustal spreading hypothesis to analysis of all linear magnetic anomalies associated with mid-oceanic mid rises. It is suggested that no clear delineation will result if spreading rate changes are invoked to force a fit of local observations to hypothetical geomagnetic polarity changes. If major crustal tectonic histories are proposed by the absence rather than the presence of the classic magnetic anomaly patterns, if minor characteristics of magnetic anomalies and available local geological data are ignored, and if, for the period prior to 4 million years ago, a geomagnetic polarity timescale which is either hypothetical or insufficiently well-defined is utilized. A summary is made of relevant rock properties and igneous thermal and structural histories before examining a published magnetic transverse and other data from the mid-Atlantic Ridge at 22.5 degrees north. It is concluded that a series of flat, finite prisms of alternating polarity, as required by the simple crustal spreading model, is inconsistent with the observations. Okay, so there's a lot of technical crap in that, but the, it's the last sentence that the really is really important. That he said they're saying that. What the theory the predicts, which is a series of flat, finite prisms of alternating polarity, that's what the basic simple theory of crustal spreading predicts, is not found in the data. That there are flips, but it's way more complicated than just a simple back and forth, back and forth, leading okay. outwards from the ridges. Okay. Okay. Part 11. A possible solution, polar shift. We have seen that the ocean spreading hypothesis, based on a conveyor belt mechanism powered by convection currents, is full of difficulties. There is, however, a way to remove most, if not all, of the difficulties. Let us suppose that the real engine to provide the force for seafloor spreading is polar wandering in the form of horizontal displacements of the entire lithosphere at the short intervals suggested by the geomagnetic evidence. Okay, so. This was important to me because we kept wondering, what does he mean by polar wandering? Is he talking about magnetic wandering? But no, he defines Physical it right here. Physical wandering. Yes, polar wandering in the form of horizontal displacements of the entire lithosphere at the short intervals suggested, suggested by the geomagnetic evidence. So we have already seen that many of those who favor the continental drift theory have also accepted polar wandering as equally indicated by the evidence. And uh, he shows a picture of the Indian Ocean bottom here, which shows the problem of the, the spread. There's, it's too complicated. You can kind of see all these different lines and cracks and fractures. So the spreading is going in multiple directions. Yes, and, yeah. exactly. But is he saying that the spreading is not happening? No, I think he, I think he does think that there is material coming up, but it's, it happens during these uh, cataclysmic periods. So because the whole lithosphere is shifting and it cracks all over the place and you get new material, but it's in all kinds of directions. So it's not, um, it's not a gradual process that's happening all the time. I thought that there was, they, they were measuring like how much the... Yeah, I think there is a slow process that's happening all the time. I haven't gotten far enough to see that yet, but I, he, he's basically saying just kind of like a catastrophist does, that you have periods of very in, much yeah, increased, increased activity. activity and his is the entire lithosphere in motion, sometimes thousands of feet a year. And that results in enormous earthquakes, massive volcanism, uh, and also fractures all over the Earth's crust, new mountains being built, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. old ones disappearing, subduction of entire sections of continent or whatever very quickly until the motion begins to slow down and stop. And then you go back to the slow, wherever the, the fractures are now, the slow pushing out of new material, but okay. yeah. 
So he says, let us visualize briefly the effects of the displacement of the lithosphere. Here we will simply point to the fact that the oblateness of the Earth involves the consequence that in any displacement of the lithosphere, parts of the Earth's surface will be under compression and others under extension. This is because such a movement will displace some areas towards the poles and others towards the equator. Areas moved poleward will be under compression, while those moved toward the equator will be stretched with consequent widespread fissuring. This enormous force of the moving, moving lithosphere would produce folding of strata in some areas and fissuring in others. Okay. Let us suppose that the world encircling mid-oceanic mid ridge and fissure system is a product of the periodical displacements of the lithosphere, a semi-permanent feature in terms of the last few hundred million years. Let us now visualize a series of displacements occurring in scattered directions rather than along a polar wandering path. We can observe that no matter in what direction the lithosphere is displaced, some parts of the mid-oceanic ridge is bound to be moved toward or across the equatorial bulge of the Earth and therefore be subjected to extension and stretching. Here, the lithosphere would be pulled apart, perhaps a matter of a few miles, and the fissure would be filled from below by magma, which, when cooled, would form new sea floor. At the same time that this area was stretched, it would follow from the assumption that another area simultaneously moved toward a pole would be compressed and the rock strata would be slightly folded as a result. In each displacement of the lithosphere, the amounts of extension and compression would be exactly equal so that no overall increase of the Earth's surface would be necessary, but the continents could, through many displacements, gradually be moved considerable distances relative to one another. Okay, yeah. Of course, the actual or the gradual extension of the ocean floors first in one area and then in another would bring pressures against the sides of the continents. As Belisov has remarked, and I pointed out in the first edition of this book, there is good geological evidence for the deep uh, subsidence of continents or parts of continents. The folding of the continental strata themselves might well provide room for the expanding sea floor. Uplifts of parts of the sea floor could also be a part of the process. After all, it is now agreed that the present oceans are not geologically very old. The continents that occupy the present ocean bas basins may not, in every case, be continents that have been pushed away by seafloor spreading. One of the problems that have puzzled geologists is the existence of the steep continental slopes, which plunge down abruptly from the edges of the continental shelves. Perhaps they have in fact resulted from the pressures of the expanding seafloors against all sides of the continents. Such pressures would naturally tend to steepen the edges of the continents. Erickson, Ewing, Heason, and Wallen seem to have observed evidence of this process. Older sediments from the vicinity of the continental slope give evidence of marked steepening of the slope through faulting or monoclinal folding in late Cenozoic time. Monoclinal. Yeah. yeah. So again, he's saying there that basically during the movement, you have drastic changes, right? But that all the time, there's you've got these ridges or whatever, and they're constantly pushing a little bit. Yeah. Okay, part 12, the speed of polar shift. We have seen that the geomagnetic evidence has generally been interpreted as suggesting that polar shift has occurred whether or not continental drift has also happened. Some geologists definitely prefer the idea of polar sh shift. Uh, Deutsch, is that how you say that? That's a, I'm pretty sure that's a German guy. Deutsch. Deutsch. Deutsch, for example, considers polar wandering more likely than continental drift, and Chadwick is in agreement. Quote, The balance of the evidence at present appears to favor displacements of the whole crust over the substratum rather than polar wandering of the whole Earth. Uh, min minids? Is that... Yeah, minus. Minus has suggested that displacements of this type might be produced by large scale convection currents in the mantle. It is usually supposed that the orogenic significance of polar wandering is slight, but the possible effects of the equatorial bulge in movements of the whole crust appear to merit further investigation. So, orogenic would be mountain building processes. 
So Deutsch cites evidence that polar shifts in the past may have occurred at such a speed as largely to escape notice by the method of geomagnetism. He states, quote, We might take 50 meters a year as a typical value for very fast hypothetical polar wandering. At this rate of 45 degree route into the North Pacific, or say 10,000 kilometers for the return journey would take 200,000 years. I think the largest interval that could conceivably have been missed in the post-Eocene record is 10 million years. Then the probability of pinning down a fast-moving pole is 2%. And for earlier periods, the chances decline even farther. farther. This should instill sobering thoughts regarding the extent of our ignorance a decade since the first spectacular results from paleomagnetism were reported. So he's saying that it could happen so fast that you just completely miss the entire movement. Like you can't see it in the data in, right. the, in the ground because so yeah. he's saying that their their smallest increment is 10 million years that they can detect like a is that what he's saying? Um like their shortest duration that they would the largest miss. interval that could have been missed in the oh. post Eocene record is yeah. 10 million years. So okay. he's saying we could have missed an entire 10 million years. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. But yeah, there are obviously smaller intervals, but he's just pointing out that there could be entire 10 million year periods that are completely missed by the missed, geomagnetic yeah, data. So a 200,000 year period would definitely yeah, it'd be It'd just missed. be completely Easily gone. Missed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this is very important for my discussion because in chapters four, five, six, and seven, I am arguing for three displacements of the lithosphere in the last 100,000 years. Okay for which but little geomagnetic confirmation is available. According to my assumptions, in the last instance, at the end of the most recent ice age in North America, the lithosphere was shifted some 30 degrees or about 2,000 miles in a period not exceeding 10,000 years. Okay. This would mean an average speed of about 1,000 feet per year, a very high speed, five times the maximum speed allowed by Deutsch. With, a, with such a speed as this, quite obviously the mathematical chances of discovering a displacement by the geomagnetic method would fall to a fraction of 1%. Wow. 30 degrees, huh? Yeah. Since the end of the last ice age. Yep. No, uh, oh, break time. Uh, and I think we can get, I think the watcher just... Okay. Around. So let's, well, let's go get him. We need him. Yeah. All right. We'll be back, folks. Workout guy here on Brothers of the Servant Podcast. <laughs> He's too buff, folks. Yeah. We got to cut down his workout time. <laughs> he started working out longer <laughs> and, uh, and now he's ripped. He's so ripped, you know. So and we're like trying to getting threatened by a guy like that yeah, is pretty yeah. scary. We're trying to <laughs> shrink him down to size, folks. <laughs> Doing it for workout guy. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's an old joke if you're new to the show. We trash people who give, have good ideas. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. I do. Russ Russ is really, you know, he's standing up for the, I'm for All the I'm saying is just, you know, just take it easy. Stick with us. Think of it as a trial period. I want to try it for the length of this book report. That's, you know, that's the provisional change okay. time here and it's basically just an experiment to see if this helps new listeners sort of grow into the show right because a lot of times people just get they they run into 45 minutes of us just rambling at the beginning and then they just lose interest so let's see if this helps that's all it's just an experiment yeah i just want more fodder for making fun of people <laughs> 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 well, there's lots of ways we can do that. Okay. Um, so a mathematical, the mathematical chances of discovering a displacement by the geomagnetic method would fail, fall to a fraction of 1%. So Deutsch cites evidence in the Precambrian rocks of Scotland, 
of a displacement of the lithosphere that seems to have occurred at a speed, quote, several orders of magnitude, unquote, faster than the hypothetical speed he referred to above, which would have been, let's see, uh, 50 meters a year, several orders of magnitude faster than 50 meters a year. Since an order of magnitude means multiplication by a factor of 10, he is obviously contemplating a very high speed indeed. At first glance, such a speed may seem improbable, but I shall present a great deal of evidence to support the assumption. In any case, it is very significant that Deutsch should say that, quote, it is still possible to argue that polar wandering was sufficiently rapid to be missed entirely by paleomagnetism, unquote. Hmm. Part 13, the mechanism for polar shift. It is necessary to admit in the first place that at the present time, there is no satisfactory explanation of the modus operandi of displacements of the lithosphere. The purpose of this book is simply to present the case for the assumption that such shifts have occurred and to show how the assumption explains numerous unsolved problems in geology and in the evolution of life. In addition, I present evidence dating the, uh, the last three displacements and placing them in the latter part of the last geological epoch, the Pleistocene. I was going to say, we might want to pull up our old oh, yeah, helpful yeah. geological chart because he's going to be I, going through the old. Can I interrupt here? I, yeah, yeah. Okay. So let me try to make this mental picture. So imagine you're, you're looking at the globe and you got the north magnetic pole. And then just imagine it being like sort of scribbling around up there. Yeah. In some random pattern. Mm-hmm. And then while you're while that magnetic pole is scribbling around, you have the spreading of the ocean floor over geologic time. Yeah. And that those magnetic grains being recorded in the ocean floor as the scribbling around and the spreading is happening. Yeah. Now start over and you have the pole sitting still. And then you have the whole crust scribbling around uh-huh. and the ocean floor spreading. Are you suggesting that they how would have the you, same result? Yeah. How do you tell the difference? That's yeah. that's the issue I have here. Yep. I agree. To me, so far, and I, I haven't completely gone through the whole book again, but so far to me, I'm I'm wondering where is the like why is the pole lithosphere shifting as opposed to the pole the the magnetic, magnetic pole shifting around a better distinct. explanation? Uh, yeah. How are and they I'm, distinct from each other? Yeah. In the data. Right. So. Uh, the one thing I thought of is, well, maybe based on the rate of change of the magnetic pole position, they can kind of rule that out. Perhaps, maybe. I don't know. Because it's too rapid. It and could happening be, yeah. all the time. Yeah. it Like, it's clearly has been moving too rapidly recently to be captured by this 10 million years of right, geologic yeah. time. Yeah. Okay. I think the biggest thing that's captured by the those... Uh, the spreading ocean floor is the complete reversals. Yeah. You know, they've noticed slowly it's reversed and then it's back and, you know, and it's done it 200 times at least. So, but it, can you tell that it, you know, was um, 11 degrees off the pole and then later it was somewhere else, you know, 14 degrees and I don't know. Can you see that yeah. distinction if it happens within 50 years? Yeah. I don't know. Okay, so to me, right now, that is still a question. Sure. How do you tell the difference? Anyway, moving on. So while the explanation of the cause of displacements may have to wait for future developments, the requirements for a successful explanation may be suggested now. Any successful explanation must account for both the initiation and the termination of such a movement. It must suggest a mechanism to provide for travel by the lithosphere at several times the rate of speed now estimated for the assumed subcrustal currents. And it will have to be exp- and it will have to explain the period periodicity as well. So in other words, he seems to think that there is a kind of cycle that you can find in this in these shifts, a periodicity. Although a specific cause for displacements is not yet in sight, there are indications of the general direction in which we may have to look for an ultimate explanation. Almost certainly any displacement of the outer shells of the Earth 
must be due to gravitational imbalances within the lithosphere or immediately below it, imbalances giving rise to centrifugal or centripetal effects, such as those originally postulated by Campbell in his elaboration of his ice cap mechanism. That such imbalances now exist is unquestioned, and some of them are considerable uh, of considerable magnitude. Centripetal being moving or directed toward a center or axis. Okay. What's the difference between that and centrifugal? I know there is one, right? Centrifugal would be moving away. Away, right? That's right. Yeah. Let me let's, well, let's look it up. Let's look it up. Was that the watcher joining us? No. No. It was the. It was the meeting asking me if we wanted to stay in there by ourselves. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, moving or directed <laughs> away, away from a center or axis. You're in this meeting by yourself, loser. Yeah. Are you sure you want to stay here? <laughs> no, I'm not sure. No one is here with you. <laughs> the principle of gravitational balance of the Earth's surface is referred to as the principle of isostasy. Theoretically, continents, ocean basins, mountain ranges, and other features are always seeking equilibrium, which they attain by rising or sinking until, like a piece of wood floating on the water, they are at an elevation that is correct for their density. They can do this because the lithosphere, as we have already pointed out, does not have great tensile strength. It can fracture easily if there is much pressure in either direction up or down. And this lets any section of the Earth's surface find its natural elevation, as if it were floating in the asthenosphere below. So the dictionary, or at least the, the Internet, describes isostasy as um, equilibrium in the Earth's crust, yeah. such that the forces tending to elevate land masses balance the forces tending to depress land masses. Yep. I, always, I just think of the term as the as the vertical movement of... Yeah, verti the vertical movement is the result of the... Isostatic of pressures. Of, of the basic physical forces that are yeah, acting yeah. upon various different gravitational yeah. masses in the crust. Yeah. And, he, and Hapgood is just pointing out that despite the fact that the crust having massive compression strength, it has very little tensile strength, so its right. vertical movement is easy relative to its... Uh, it, vertical de strength. deformation, I should say, is easy relative to uh, like lateral. Crushing. Yeah, lateral yeah. deformation. Yeah. Okay. So laterally, it would tend to fold or go, you know, one piece goes under another, whereas vertically, it can just, it'll just go up and down. It'll, it'll crack, shift, whatever. Okay. Um, okay. And I, and, I think and it's I, important to point out, though, that, that because it's a, a a sphere or a oblate spheroid, uh, the vertical movement actually makes room laterally. Yeah. Because, you know, like a circle, if, you, if you're looking at it as a circle and you move a part of the circle away from the center, then you have a longer line, a longer line going yes. around the circle. So you have more room for stuff. That's right. Um, but yeah, he, it's interesting the way he phrased it. I read this a bunch of times when I was going through this. He says, the principle of gravitational balance of the Earth's surface is referred to as the principle of isostasy. Yeah. He's just basically saying that if you take everything into account, the fact that it's spinning, the fact that it has gravity that's pushing things towards the middle, the, the spinning is pushing things away, outwards, and then you have various differing masses in the crust, that that's what, that, that those masses seeking gravitational equilibrium balance, yes. is going to balance by things moving up or down. Right, right. Yeah. It's really interesting, a way to put yeah. it. Yes, it is. Yeah. So. Like, okay, well, I would think of it, you, you, could, you could do this as a, like if you have a heavy, like if you say you're spinning something, you, put, you have something on a, on a, a plate or whatever, and you're yeah. going to spin it, and you've got these fixed weights. Mm -hmm. If you have a heavy weight and a light weight, they can't both be on the same that's right. part, you know, circle in that on that plate. You have to move the heavier weight in towards the center to yeah. balance the spinning. Right. That's right. And and like this is how like for example, wheels on cars are balanced. Like the the tire itself or maybe the rim whatever, there's some part of it that's heavier 
than yeah. the rest. So when you spin it, it wobbles. So they put a heavy weight at the opposite side yeah. or whatever, at the opposite side of the, the, the congruence of forces yeah. to, to balance that out. But this, because the Earth is just a natural object, it's going to be seeking those uh, balances all the time. Yeah. You know, sometimes faster, sometimes slower. So this is interesting about those giant globs down in the mantle that they've been studying, right? These two massive globs that are underneath, one of them is underneath the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. Are they gravitational anomalies? And if they are, they notice them in various different types of seismic data and stuff. It's right, so that's density. Yeah, they're seeing that they're giant, dense objects. Right. So if it l- results in a gravitational anomaly, it would result in a change in what may be necessary on the surface right. yeah, above yeah, that yeah. thing. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. Interesting. So one may be responsible for the depth of the, of the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. Could be. I can't remember. We'll have to pull up those stories. We could do them. I could do some of those stories uh, at the end of the show during the book report. Yeah. So Hapgood says, uh, so they can do this because the lithosphere, as we've already pointed out, does not have great tensile strength. It can fracture easily if there is much pressure in either direction, up or down. And this lets any section of the Earth's surface find its natural elevation as if it were floating in the asthenosphere below. I say theoretically. In practice, we see that this theory does not always work the Earth's surface does get out of balance. There are certainly movements of some sort going on within the body of the Earth by which great masses of material are changing position, sometimes uplifting or depressing the surface. In these movements, the balance of density both at the surface and below it within the lithosphere may be upset. So that's kind of what you're just talking about. If I may suggest, despite our present state of ignorance, a specific example of a displacement, let us suppose that a large surplus or deficiency of mass is brought into existence somewhere near the surface of the Earth. This could result from the rise of material under the lithosphere, uplifting it, or by the reverse process, a sinking causing a depression of the lithosphere. According to the principles of the dynamics of rotating bodies, Surplus math ne- mass near the Earth's surface will cause a centrifugal effect, operating outward at right angles to the Earth's axis, while deficiencies of mass will cause a centripetal effect, operating inward. The tangential components of these forces, as shown by Campbell, would operate... Equ- uh, how would you say this? Equator word. Equator word. <laughs> <laughs> Towards the equator. <laughs> In the case of surplus masses and poleward in the case of deficiencies. So if you have more mass, it would push that, it would tend to push it towards the equator. If there's a deficiency, it would tend to move that towards the pole or go up and down. Let us assume that we have a large surplus mass lying in and under the lithosphere on one side of the earth and that the centrifugal effect of this mass is sufficient to start a displacement of the outer shells of the earth over the waveguide layer. Remember that the waveguide layer is a relatively thin layer discovered sometime in the 50s that is, um, relative to the layers above and below it, very fluid. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Low low viscosity. That's what the Russian guy called it, yeah. Is it because, like, certain types of waves freely travel through it or something, really? Like, it's... Yeah, and it changes seismic waves Uh, that move through it. That's cool. The important thing to note is that this force is progressive. When a displacement, once a displacement starts, the force increases by geometrical progression with the increasing distance of the anomalous mass from the Earth's axis of rotation. The tangential component of the force, however, begins to decline because before the equator is reached and reverses after that point so that the movement is braked and finally brought to a stop. In other words, if you have something, say, in the middle of North America somewhere and it's its greater mass is wanting to push it towards the equator. Once it gets moving, it's going to move faster and faster because the spin of the earth is accelerating accelerating it. But once it gets to the equator, it starts to pass it, but then the force reverses and it tends to stop the whole movement. Right. With the thing basically at the equator or somewhere near it. Yeah, there's always... Yeah. Yeah. It always passes it up. It's never going to stop. Yeah, it's going to pass it. Yeah. 
Unless and then there's, there's going to be, at the, when it comes to rest, there's going to be a force pushing on it in the opposite direction. Right. And the force pushing on it in the op- opposite direction from passing it is what Hapgood is saying is going to stop the movement of the whole lithosphere. Yeah, yeah. This is his explanation for he's like, not only do you have to provide a mechanism to get it going, but you also have to explain why it stops. Right, right. So that could e- even, um, depending on the size of the object or you know, and and how it's positioned and how rigid it is, you can get twisting, turning. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, and if it's more complicated because there's other masses that are yeah, going yeah, to yeah. get involved, they're not enough to get something started, but once it yeah. gets going, they're all involved in it as well. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Huh. So this example satisfies the first two requirements for an acceptable mechanism. That is, that it has to get it going and then it has to stop it. The waveguide layer found by Belusov is of great advantage for this concept of displacement. It suggests an easy zone of shear for the movement, wherein all frictional effects will be minimized. Actually, the displacement would take place, according to this thinking, at a level where the viscosity of the asthenosphere would be reduced to its lowest point by the fluid waveguide layer. And so the lithosphere would, in effect, be borne along on a stream flowing in a liquid much as the Gulf Stream flows over the deeper waters of the ocean. The movement might be the equivalent of a flow of liquid over liquid. Friction would be minimized while viscosity would present no bar to a comparatively rapid displacement. The last point is one of great importance. For the field studies I am presenting below indicate that the shifts of the lithosphere have at times attained extraordinary speeds as compared with the speeds of subcrustal currents now estimated by geophysicists. The combination of the geometrical progression of centrifugal effects with the zone of easy shear in the waveguide layer opens up the possibility of extremely rapid movements of the Earth's outer shell. In later chapters, the reader will find much empirical field evidence in support of this. It should be borne in mind that while the displacement of the Earth's whole outer shell would be an event of gigantic magnitude, it might actually meet less resistance than the movement of a large convection current. The convection currents imagined by geophysicists involve the movement of trillions of tons of highly viscous rock against the viscous resistance of the Earth's mantle. In a displacement of the lithosphere over the waveguide layer, on the other hand, there would be minimum friction at the interface. It would involve only a very thin layer of the most liquid part of the asthenosphere. The movement would be one of gliding, acknowledged to be the most economical form of motion. Again, like the ice skate that you brought up. So he's basically saying there... Just to be clear, the convection currents that are currently imagined by geologists as explaining movements of continental drift. In other words, he's saying, well, that starting at the core and going upwards and then spreading out once it hits the lithosphere or the bottom of the asthenosphere or whatever is you're talking about trillions of tons of stuff moving through heavily viscous and plastic stuff. His explanation is way simpler in terms of getting past all that problem, like you have a thin layer sliding over something that's relatively friction-free. Yeah. Part 14. Is the pole moving now? Two rather curious pieces of evidence suggest that the lithosphere may be in motion at the present time. We have two observations of a movement of the North Pole with reference to the Earth's surface. The first of these is cited by Deutsch on the authority of Monk and MacDonald. It suggests that the North Pole moved 10 feet in the direction of Greenland along the meridian of 45 degrees west longitude during the period from 1900 to 1960. This would be at a rate of 6 centimeters or 2.5 inches per year. The other finding cited by Markowitz based on later data suggests that the pole moved about 20 feet between 1900 and 1968 along the meridian of 65 degrees west longitude, and that it is now moving at the rate of about 10 centimeters or four inches a year. The difference between the two longitudes may not be particularly important as the angular difference so near the pole is so small, but the difference between the two rates of motion may be very important. In the first place, it may be noted that a speed of 10 centimeters a year is two or three times the maximum speed usually estimated for subcrustal convection currents. This appears to imply that the displacement indicated as now occurring is not powered by convection currents. 
there is the suggestion of another mechanism at work. So that's interesting. Wow. Yeah. He also later points out that there might be an acceleration in there because you have 1900 to 1960 saying 10 feet and then 1900 to 1968, 20 feet. So he's saying, did it move an additional 10 feet between 1960 and 1968? (laughs) Chapter two, the failure to explain ice ages. The evidence for displacements of the Earth's outer shell is scattered over many parts of the Earth and comes from several fields of science. It would not be justifiable to disregard this other evidence simply because the evidence from geomagnetism seems so strong. No other field furnishes so dramatic a confirmation of displacements as glacial geology. Here we review the facts that have led geologists at various times during the last hundred years to consider ideas of polar shift. Part one, the failure of the older theories. A little more than a hundred years ago, people were astonished at the suggestion that great ice sheets as much as a mile thick had once lain over the temperate lands of North America and Europe. Many ridiculed the idea, as happens with new ideas in every age, and sought to discredit the evidence produced in favor of it. Eventually, the facts were established regarding an ice age in Europe and in North America, People later accepted the idea of not one, but a series of ice ages. As time went on, evidences were found of ice ages on all the continents, even in the tropics. It was found that ice sheets had once covered vast areas of tropical India and equatorial Africa. From the beginning, geologists devoted much attention to the possible cause of such great changes in the climate. One theory after another was proposed, but as the information available gradually increased, each theory was found to be in conflict with the facts and, as a consequence, had to be discarded. In 1929, Coleman, one of the leading authorities on the Ice Ages, wrote, quote, Scores of methods of accounting for Ice Ages have been proposed, and probably no other geological problem has been so seriously discussed not only by glaciologists, but by meteorologists and biologists. Yet no theory is generally generally accepted. The opinions of those who have written on the subject are hopelessly in contradiction with one another, and good authorities are arrayed on opposite sides." One problem that writers on the Ice Ages have attempted to solve, sometimes in rather fantastic ways but without success, is that of the wrong location of the great ice caps of the past. These ice caps have refused to have anything to do with the polar areas of the present day, except in a quite incidental fashion. Originally, it was thought that in glacial periods, the ice caps would fan out from the poles, but then it appeared that none of them did so, except the ones that have existed in Antarctica. Coleman drew attention to the essential facts as follows. Quote, In early times, it was supposed that during the glacial period, a vast ice cap radiated from the North Pole, extending varying distances southward over seas and continents. It was presently found, however, that some northern countries were never covered by ice, and that in reality there were several more or less distinct ice sheets starting from local centers and expanding in all directions, north as well as east and west and south. It was found, too, that these ice sheets were distributed in what seemed to be a capricious manner. Siberia, now including some of the coldest parts of the world, was not covered. And the same was true of most of Alaska and the Yukon Territory in Canada, while northern Europe, with its relatively mild climate, was buried under ice as far south as London and Berlin. And most of Canada and the United States were covered, the ice reaching as far south as Cincinnati in the Mississippi Valley. With regard to an earlier age, the Permo-Carboniferous, Coleman emphasized that the locations of the ice caps were even further out of line. Quote, Unless the continents have shifted their position since that time, the Permo-Carboniferous glaciation occurred chiefly in what is now the southern temperate zone and did not reach the Arctic regions at all. So I wonder when I'm reading this, I mean, it, it seems like they would... um understand this but more recent 
glaciations tend to obscure older ones if they're going over top of each other. Yeah. So he's saying, well, we have an ice age that appears to start in the southern temperate zone, and it does not appear to reach the current Arctic regions at all. But does that just is that just because our current Arctic regions have more recent scouring by glaciers than can be found? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah. All right, so you pulled up a chart there. Where's the, be... where's the permo carboniferous? <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> uh, I don't see it in there. Here we go. Carboniferous is in the Paleozoic. Paleozoic. So, so that permo would carboniferous. Be the Permian would... carboniferous. Would be yeah, the... the boundary there. Yeah. So it's the late Paleozoic period from 252 to, I don't know, 300 million years ago. I'll find a better one. Okay. We had a great one we were using. For, is that it right there? This one? Yeah. Is that the one we were using when we were doing... Uh, uh, this one. There's Permian uh, Carboniferous around 299. Yeah, 300 million years ago. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll see if that one works. <laughs> So unless the continents have shifted their positions since that time, the Permo-Carboniferous glaciation occurred chiefly in what is now the southern temperate zone and did not reach the Arctic regions at all. So he is much upset by the fact that this ice age apparently did not affect Europe. Quote, Unless European geologists have overlooked evidence of glaciation at the end of the Carboniferous or at the beginning of the Permian, the continent escaped the worst of the glaciation that had such overwhelming effects on other parts of the world. The reason for this exemption is not easily found, unquote. One of the most extraordinary cases is that of the great ice sheet that covered most of India in this period. Geologists are able to tell from a careful study of the glacial evidences in what direction an ice sheet moved. And in this case, the ice sheet moved northward from an ice center in southern India for a distance of 1,100 miles. Coleman comments on this as follows. Quote, Now, an ice sheet on level ground, as it seems to have been in India, must necessarily extend in all directions, since it is not the slope of the surface it rests on that sets it in motion, but the thickness of the ice towards the central parts. The Indian ice sheet should push southward as well as northward. Did it really push as far to the south of latitude 17 degrees as to the north? Because it extended 1,100 miles to the salt range in the north. If it extended the same distance to the south, it would reach the equator. And the great South African geologist A. L. Dutois pointed out that the ice caps of all geological periods in the southern hemisphere were eccentric as regards the South Pole just as the Pleistocene ice caps were eccentric with regard to the North Pole. It is, is it not extraordinary that the Antarctic ice cap, which we can actually see because it now exists, is the only one of all these ice caps that is found in the polar zone? Coleman, who did a great deal of fieldwork in Africa and India, studying the evidences of the ice ages there, writes interestingly of his experiences in finding the signs of intense cold in areas where he had to toil in the blazing heat of the tropical sun. Quote, On a hot evening in early winter, two and a half degrees within the torrid zone amid tropical surroundings, it was very hard to imagine this region as covered for thousands of years with thousands of feet of ice. The contrast of the present with the past was astounding, and it was easy to see why some of the early geologists fought so long against the idea of glaciation in India at the end of the Carboniferous. Unquote. So I think the Carboniferous maybe now is divided into the Pennsylvanian and Mississippian. Mm. All right. Um, yeah, I see that. Yeah. Because that just... But whatever. 359 to 299 million years ago. All right. So that was his... That was Coleman's account from working in India. And then here's an account of him looking for similar glaciation evidence in Africa. Some hours of scrambling and hammering under the intense African sun in latitude 27 degrees without a drop of water while collecting striated stones and a slab of polished floor of slate 
provided a most impressive contrast between the present and the past. For though August 27th is still early spring, the heat is fully equal to that of a sunny August day in North America. The dry, wilting glare and perspiration made the thought of an ice sheet thousands of feet thick at that very spot most incredible, but most alluring, unquote. Okay, I just was looking this up. How far back... Does the Antarctic ice cores go, like the dating on those? Oh, yeah, I what, know what some of it's millions of years, right? Well, I don't know. It says oldest ice core. I'm seeing this. Just, I, I just Googled this. Well, I duck, duck, goat it. <laughs> oldest ice core finding a 1.5 million year old record of Earth's climate. Okay. So that's not nearly as long as I thought. That yeah. It, Good point. So, yeah, I was just thinking about this because th that's where the oldest ice is that we know of, right? Right. I think so. I can't say with confidence, but I think you're right that in parts of the Antarctic uh, ice sheet that you were finding the oldest ice. Oldest ice core. Where's the oldest ice? <laughs> <laughs> Where's the oldest ice? I don't know. <laughs> okay, oh, here's another one. World's oldest ice core could stretch back five million years. This is uh, summer, Southern Hemisphere summer of 2017 and 18. The team drilled an ice core measuring 9.5 meters, 31 feet long and have since analyzed the age of the material at different depths. So, Okay. Five million, did you say? It said could, could, could. stretch back five million years. All right. Two million year old ice cores provide first direct observations of something. <laughs> I'm not clicking on the links. I'm just... What... So currently, the oldest continuous ice core goes back eight hundred thousand. Yeah, years. that's. I I was thinking there, and we're in the hundreds of like less than a million years is the continuous yeah. record. But you can imagine that it would be difficult, even if that ice is really old. That the the stuff at the bottom, the oldest stuff, is constantly getting sort of churned. You know, how do you tell how old it is? Unless it's stagnant. This is weird. I'm getting different dates. Oldest ice core ever drilled dates back 2.7 million years. <laughs> next next one, Science Daily. Oldest ice core finding a 1.5 million year old record of Earth's climate. <laughs> so what is the deal here? I don't know. Well, let's take a break. We can check more in yeah. the break. All right. I, I just, I think it's important because, I mean, we were just talking about this with the, with the, uh, you know the po what was the guy's name we interviewed with the uh, oh Martin yeah from uh, Mario Build Reps, Build Reps. yeah because yeah. we were asking like well you know what are what's up with these dates like you know how how do they know for sure about the ice core dates yeah and he was saying that they can count days mm -hmm. yeah that's the continuous record that you were talking about eight hundred thousand yeah. yeah yeah it's the oldest ice which. You know, it doesn't even cover the Pleistocene. Have that scene. stuck in my head now. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll be right back. We'll be right back. <laughs> we live to sacrifice my cores. <laughs> We are back, ladies and gentlemen, Brothers of the Servant podcast. And we are second continuing half the second half of the show, and we are continuing through uh, Path of the Pole by Charles Hapgood, bringing up great questions. We still don't know where the oldest ice was. And Kyle, you know, we're talking about the difference between continuous and like what is it like at the edges of the ice, the coastlines of Antarctica. 
versus the interior up in the mountains. Yeah, and the point was is if if the whole crust had shifted 30 degrees, the mountainous areas of Antarctica would still probably be collecting ice. No, yeah. Yeah, I think it so. It would be an accumulation zone, so you right. can still find uh, ice cores that go back right. that far. Now, you old. pointed out that on the outer edges of the continental shelf of Antarctica, they found where the sea floor... Yeah, they're... Yes, the, the sediments seem to have an oscillation of rivers. Yes, like flowing rivers. Right, coming you have off the... you have thick layers of glacial till, which is rough. Un, uh, you know, uh, what what is it called? Like, it's it's very rough material that's being dropped by the ice, being ground out off of the off the land and dropped into the ocean, and then uh, that oscillates between very fine sediments of basically river flows, what's associated with you know river sediments. <clears throat> So if that's true, then, you know, then, then... So, in other words, we can still have the ice cores in Antarctica going back millions of years in some places. Yeah. And the crust shifting up to 30 degrees, at least, and not, right. you know, not really destroying completely the, um, the ice on the mountains. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting because if... If it's got mountainous ice in some areas and it's around 30, 30-ish degrees from the South Pole and then the result, then the next shift pushes it towards the pole, that ice wouldn't necessarily be destroyed by that right. movement and it's just going to grow from there yeah. and yeah. spread out and cover the entire two big land masses and the uh, channel between I'm, them. I'm trying to fit this in with the maps of the ancient sea kings too, right? Oh, yeah, they, yeah. Like there was times when... The coastline, at least part of the coastline of Antarctica, was ice-free. Right. So if it was shifted away from the South Pole enough, you could have the one coast of it yep. being ice-free. Yes, that's right. You're right. Because there's recent history. Yeah, and that's so. More the more we go through this book, I'm thinking we're gonna have to do maps too. We're gonna have to do maps of the ancient oh, seekings so because it's like it it all ties together, you know. And it's the same guy's research, and you just I want to see like how. Does he tie these? Does he tie these things together at all? Yeah. Okay. Great, great book. Yeah. Okay, so the last bit we read was a quote from Coleman talking about working in India and then in Africa, digging up geological evidence of massive ice sheets in very hot places. And he's just like, this is hard to imagine. He that... works in very hot places as a geologist. His <laughs> name is Coleman. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I've been waiting for him to mention seams of coal. So, when these facts were established, geologists sought to explain them by assuming that at periods when these areas were glaciated, they were elevated much higher above sea level than they are now. Theoretically, so you can see even there that the, the, an elevation would account for a massive amount of ice put onto it, right? Theoretically, even an area near the equator, if elevated several miles above sea level, would be cold enough for an ice sheet. What made the theory plausible was the well-known fact that the elevations of all the lands of the globe have changed repeatedly and drastically during the course of geological history. Unfortunately for those who tried to explain the misplaced ice caps this way, however, Coleman showed that they reached sea level within the tropics on three continents, Asia, Africa, and Australia. The ice the ice sheets did? Yes, yeah. So part three, worldwide phases of cold weather. A widely accepted assumption with which contemporary geologists approach the question of ice ages is that the latter have occurred as the result of a lowering of the average temperature of the whole surface of the Earth at the same time. This assumption has forced them to look for causes of glacial periods only in such factors as would tend to cool the whole surface of the Earth at once. It has resulted in the assumption that glacial periods have always been simultaneous in the northern and southern hemispheres. It is remarkable that this assumption has been maintained over a long period of time despite the fact that it is in sharp conflict with basic principles of physics in the field of meteorology. The basic conflict was brought to the attention of science at least 70 years ago, but it has never been resolved. It consists essentially of the fact that glacial periods were periods of heavier rainfall in areas outside the regions of the ice sheets, 
so that this, together with the deep accumulation of ice in the great ice sheets, apparently must have involved a higher average rate of precipitation during ice ages. There is a great deal of geological evidence in support of this. Only recently, for example, Davies has discussed the so-called pluvial periods in Africa and has correlated them with the Pleistocene glacial periods. Now, meteorologists point out that if precipitation is to be increased, there has to be a greater supply of moisture in the air, and the only possible way of increasing the amount of moisture in the air is to raise the temperature yeah, of the guess. air. <laughs> it would seem, therefore, that to get an ice age, one would have to raise, rather than lower, yes. the average temperature. This essential fact of physics was pointed out as long ago as 1892 by Sir Robert Ball, who quoted an earlier remark by Tyndall. Professor Tyndall has remarked that the heat that would be required to evaporate enough water to form a glacier would be sufficient to fuse and transform into glowing molten liquid a stream of cast iron five times as heavy as the glacier itself. Oh my God. William Lee Stokes has again called attention to this unsolved problem in an article entitled Another Look at the Ice Age in a statement that strongly suggests crust displacement. Quote, Lowering temperatures and increased precipitation are considered to have existed side by side on a worldwide scale and over a long period in apparent defiance of sound climatological theory. Among the many quotations that would be that could be cited reflecting the need for a more comprehensive explanation of this difficulty, the following seems typical. In the Arequipa region of Peru, as in many others in both hemispheres where Pleistocene conditions have been studied, this period appears to have been characterized by increased precipitation as well as lower temperatures. If, however, precipitation was then greater over certain areas of the Earth's surface than it is at present, a corollary seems to have been implied that over other large areas, evaporation was greater than normal to supply increased precipitation, and hence, in these latter areas, the climate was warmer than normal. This seems at first to be an astonishing conclusion. We might propose the hypothesis that climatic conditions were far from steady in any one area, but were subject to large shifts and that intervals of ameliorated conditions in some regions coincided with increased severity in others. The Pleistocene, then, may have been a period of sharper contrasts of climate and of shifting climates rather than a period of greater cold overall. From a number of points of view, the foregoing passage is extremely remarkable. Stokes recognizes the fact that the basic assumption of contemporary geologists regarding the glacial periods is in conflict with the laws of physics. Then, in the passage he quotes, he draws attention to the implications, which, if the theory of continental drift is rejected, seem to point directly to crust displacement. For in what other way can we explain how one part of the Earth's surface was colder and another, at the same time, was warmer than at present. One of the arguments that are advanced in support of the assumption of worldwide periods of colder weather, which remains the generally accepted assumption of glaciologists, has its basis in geological evidence purporting to prove that ice ages occurred simultaneously in both hemispheres. A decade ago, however, Krober pointed to the essential weakness of this geological evidence when he showed the difficulty of correlating stratified deposits of different areas. Quote, there is plenty of geological evidence in many parts of the earth of changes of climates, especially between wet and dry areas, and some of these happened in the Pleistocene. But the correlation of such changes as they occurred in widely separated regions and especially as between permanently ice-free and glaciated areas is an intricate tricky and highly technical matter on which the anthropological student must take the word of geologists and climatologists, and these are by no means in agreement. They may be reasonably sure of one of one series of climatic successions in one region and of another in a second or third region, but there may be little direct evidence on the correspondence of the several series of regional stages, the identification of which then remains speculative." Unquote. So I think he's talking about, like, you might find in this area evidence of climate shifts and then in another area evidence of climate shifts, but actually saying that these were the same climate shifts over vast distances is difficult. Okay. 
At the time that Krober remarked on the difficulty of correlating climatic changes in different, different parts of the world, we were not yet in possession of the data recently provided by the new techniques of radiocarbon and ionium dating. The effect of these new data have been to shorten very greatly our estimate of the duration of the last North American ice age. This estimate has been reduced in the last few years from about 150,000 years to about 50,000 years. Now, if we adopt the view that ancient glaciations, of which we know little, may reasonably be considered to have been the results of the same causes that brought about the North American Ice Age, then we must grant that they too may have been of short duration. But if this is true, how is it possible to establish the fact that they were contemporary in the two hemispheres? A geological period has a duration of millions of years. An ice age in Europe and one in Australia might both be, for example, of Eocene age, but the Eocene epoch is estimated to have lasted about 15 million years. We can discriminate roughly between strata dating from the early, middle, or late Eocene, but we have no way of pinpointing the date of any event in the Eocene. Even with the new techniques of radio dating now being applied to the older rocks, it is possible to determine dates only to within a margin of error of about a million years. How, then, is it possible to determine that an ice sheet in one hemisphere was really contemporary with an ice sheet or an ice age in the other? So he's, he's getting at the idea that maybe all these ice sheets were the result of being at, in the polar region. Yeah. Rather so than they're saying, not well, necessarily contemporary. With yeah, each other. rather than, and instead of saying, well, the whole planet got colder yeah. and ice was everywhere, roughly in the Eocene period, he's saying, no, what you have is a bunch of small, short ice ages, just like our most recent one, shown by radiocarbon dating, that were very short but vast, and you would have no way of pinpointing these and saying, like, well, that one is contemporary with this one, and so they may all actually be at different times over a period of five, 15 million years, but when the pole was, or when that area was nearer the pole or okay. whatever. Yeah. I wonder if that's still the case, like if they found some other way of correlating. Yeah, I don't know. The time. The attempt to maintain the assumption of the simultaneousness, simultaneousness of glaciations for older geological periods is unreasonable. I shall show in what follows that it cannot be established even for recent geological time. It is my impression that the material evidence for the assumption was never impressive and that the assumption was never derived empirically from the evidence, but was borrowed a priori from the parent assumption, that is, the assumption of the lowering of global temperatures during ice ages, an assumption which is, as already pointed out, in conflict with the laws of physics. If it is true that the fundamental assumption underlying most of the theories produced to explain ice ages is in error, we should expect that these theories, despite their many differences, would have a common quality of futility. And so it turns out. It is interesting to list the kinds of hypothetical causes that have been suggested to explain ice ages on the assumption of a worldwide lowering of temperature. They are as follows. A. Variations in the quantity of particle emission and of the radiant heat given off by the sun. B. Interception of part of the sun's radiation by clouds of interstellar gas or dust. C. Variations in the heat of space, that is, the temperature of particles floating in space, which, entering the Earth's atmosphere, might affect its temperature. And D. Variations in the quantities of dust particles in the atmosphere, from volcanic eruptions or other causes, or variations in the proportion of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. There are serious objections to all of these suggestions. So far as the variation of the sun's radiation is concerned, it is known that it varies slightly over short periods, but there is no evidence that it has ever varied enough or for a long enough time to cause an ice age. Evidence for the second and third suggestions is entirely lacking, and the fourth suggestion is deprived of value because, on the one hand, no causes can be suggested for long-term changes in the number of eruptions or in the atmospheric proportion of di carbon dioxide, and, on the other, there is insufficient evidence to show that the change has ever occurred. So I, when I was reading through this, I do know that, at least now, that there is a lot of evidence about much increased carbon dioxide in various periods of the past. 
Yeah. So that's that's different now, at least. He says that there that there's no evidence of changes in the atmospheric proportions of carbon dioxide. And I think we do have that now. Maybe from ice core proxy data. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. <clears throat> Another group of theories attempts to explain ice ages as the results of changes in the relative positions of the Earth and the Sun. These are of two kinds. Changes in the distance between the Earth and the Sun at particular times because of changes in the shape of the Earth's orbit. And changes in the angle of inclination of the Earth's axis, which occur regularly as the result of precession. The argument that precession was the cause of ice ages was advanced by Drayson in the last century. The argument based on these astronomical changes has been brought up to date in the recent work of Brouwer and Van Werkum and Emiliani, and it now seems that these astronomical changes may produce cyclical changes in the distribution of the sun's heat and perhaps in the amount of the sun's heat retained by the Earth, but it is agreed by Emiliani and others that by itself, the insulation curve or net temperature difference would not be sufficient to cause an ice age without the operation of other factors. And so Emiliani suggests that perhaps changes in elevation coinciding with the cool phases of the insulation curve may have caused the Pleistocene ice ages. One weakness of this suggestion is, of course, the necessity to suppose the accidental combination of two independent causes for ice ages. There is another objection to be advanced against all theories supposing a general fall of world temperatures during the ice ages. We have seen that ice ages existed in the tropics and that great ice caps covered vast areas on and near the equator. This happened not once but several times. The question is if the temperature of the whole earth fell enough to permit ice sheets a mile thick to develop on the equator, just where did the fauna and flora go for refuge? How did they survive? How did the reef corals, which require a minimum seawater temperature of 68 degrees Fahrenheit throughout the year, manage to survive? We know that the reef corals, for example, existed long before the period of the tropical ice sheets. Furthermore, we know that the great forests of the Carboniferous period, which gave us most of our coal, lived both earlier than and contemporaneously with the glaciations of Africa and India, though in different places. Obviously, this would have been impossible if the temperature of the whole Earth had been simultaneously reduced for the equatorial zone itself would have been uninhabitable while all er other areas were still colder. It is small wonder then that W.B. Wright insisted over a quarter of a century ago that the permo-carboniferous ice sheets in Africa and India were proof of a shift of the poles. Wow, that's really cool. And he's right. Like, if the equator was cold enough to have a mile-thick ice sheet, sheet, then anywhere north or south of that would have been even colder, mostly, for the most part. So where would all the animals and plants survive? Yeah. And the like he's pointing out, the coral reefs that require a minimum temperature of 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, if on the equator it's cold enough to have ice sheet, then the ocean's going to be cold. Right. So there would be no reefs. But he's still not really, I mean, they're talking about solar activity, but that's the only, you know, exogenic part of... Right. I keep idea. thinking of impacts. Like, yeah. an impact can throw a bunch of water, throw a bunch of water in the atmosphere and also and, make it much colder by putting dust yeah. everywhere. Yeah, but it only lasts 50 years or something. It isn't going... But can it trigger some kind of, like, threshold type of, you know, yeah. situation where it just... Yep. It's like, like a feedback loop. Mm-hmm. Especially if you have like it could also deck and traps, right? You have this continuous, what seems massive to be a, outpouring of yeah, yeah. which yes. is just pumping gas and dust and stuff into the atmosphere constantly. Yep. A big impact could also tip the scales in a complete lithosphere movement. If yeah, that's if, true. If there's been a steady buildup of something wanting to move, but it doesn't yeah, yeah. quite, and you give and it that little just vibration. Just tap it. You know? Yeah. Ding. Yep. Yeah. Part four, the new evidence of radiocarbon dating. <laughs> the question of the causes of ice ages has been given increased importance by a recent revolution in our methods of dating geological events. 
In the course of the last 20 years, all of our ideas regarding the chronology of the recent ice ages, their durations, and the speed and growth and disappearance of the great ice sheets has been transformed. This is altogether the most important new development in the sciences of the Earth. The repercussions in many directions are most remarkable. In order to get an idea of the extent of the change, let us see what the situation was only 10 or 15 years ago. As everybody is aware, geologists are used to thinking in terms of millions of years. A ge to a geologist, a period of one million years has come to mean almost nothing at all. He is actually used to thinking that events that took place somewhere within the same 20 million year period were basically contemporaneous. <laughs> As to the Ice Ages, the older ones were simply thrown into one of these long geological periods, but there was no way to determine their durations, except very roughly, or their speeds of development, or precisely when they happened. It was convenient to assume that they had endured for hundreds of thousands or for millions of years, though no real evidence of this existed. So far as the most recent division of geological time, the Pleistocene, was concerned, geologists, with much more evidence to work from, saw that there had been at least four ice ages in a period of about one million years. They consequently proposed the idea that the Pleistocene was not at all like previous periods. It was exceptional because it had so many ice ages. They may have been misled, misled. <laughs> They were misled. They were misled by the failure to take sufficient account of the fact that glacial evidence is very easily destroyed and that as we go further back into geological history, the mathematical chances of finding evidences of glaciation, never very good, decrease by geometrical progression. Down to 20 years ago, it was the considered judgment of geologists that the last ice age in North America which they refer to as the Wisconsin glaciation, began about 150,000 years ago and ended some 30,000 years ago, as I have already said. This opin opinion appeared to be based on strong evidence. The estimates of the date of the end of the Ice Age were supported by the careful counting of clay varves and by numerous seemingly reliable estimates of the age of Niagara Falls. As a consequence, experts were contemptuous of all those who, for one reason or another, attempted to argue that the Ice Age was more recent. One of these was Drayson, whose theory called for a very recent Ice Age. His followers produced much, much evidence, but it was ignored. When the Swedish scientist Gerard Degier, maybe, I don't know, established by Clay Varv counting that the ice sheet was withdrawing from Sweden as recently as 13,000 years ago, the implications were not really accepted, nor were his results popularly known. Books continued to appear even 30 years afterward with the original estimates of the age of the ice cap. Then, following World War II, nuclear physicists and physics made possible the development of new techniques for dating geological events, and one of these was radiocarbon dating. Since radiocarbon exists in nature and has a relatively short half-life, the quantity of it in any substance containing organic carbon will decline perceptibly in periods of a few centuries. By estimating how much carbon was contained originally in the specimen and then measuring what still remains, the date of its geologic formation can be found to within a small margin of error. When this method was first developed by Libby, it could date anything containing carbon of organic origin back to about 20,000 years ago. Since then, the method has been improved through the efforts of many scientists, and its range has been approximately tripled. The first major result of the radiocarbon method was the re revelation that the last North American ice sheet had indeed disappeared at a very recent date. Tests made in 1951 showed that it staged a re-advance in Wisconsin as recently as 11,000 years ago. So the re-advance would be the Younger Dryas. Younger Dryas. When this date is compared with other dates showing the establishment of a climate like the present one in North America, it seems that most of the retreat and disappearance of the great continental ice cap, at least in the United States, can have taken little more than two or three thousand years. What was the significance of this new discovery besides showing how wrong the geologists had been before? <laughs> the, fa the fact is that so sudden a disappearance of continental ice cap raises fundamental questions. It contradicts some basic assumptions of geological science. 
What has become of those gradually acting forces that were supposed to govern glaciation as well as all other geological processes? What factor can account for this astonishing rate of change? It seems self-evident that no astronomical change and no subcrustal change deep in the Earth can occur at that rate. When this discovery was made, I expected that the next revelation must be to the effect that the Wisconsin ice sheet had had its origin at a much more recent time than was suspected, and that the whole length of the glacial period was but a fraction of the former estimates. I had a while to wait because radiocarbon dating in 1951 was not able to answer this question. But by 1954, the technique had been improved so that it could determine dates as far back as 30,000 years ago. Many datings of the earlier phases of the Wisconsin glaciation were made, and Horberg, who assembled them, reached the conclusion that the ice cap, instead of being 150,000 years old, had appeared in Ohio only 25,000 years ago. This conclusion has been so great a shock that some writers have sought to evade the clear implications by questioning the reliability of the radiocarbon method. Horberg betrays evidence of the intensity of the shock to accepted beliefs when he says that the results of the evidence are so appalling from the standpoint of accepted theory that it may be necessary to either abandon the concept of gradual change in geology or to question the radiocarbon method. I find that really interesting. In this book, I am not going to question the general reliability of the radiocarbon method. I intend merely to question the theories with which this new evidence is in conflict. Dr. Horberg says that the necessity to compress all the later stages of the Wisconsin glaciation into the incredibly short period of 15 or 20,000 years involves an acceleration of geological processes, snowfall, rainfall, erosion, sedimentation, and melting that seems to challenge the principle laid down by the founder of modern geology, Sir Charles Lyell, over a century ago. Lyell's principle, called uniformitarianism, stated that geological processes have always gone on about as they are going on now. Oh, Lyle. <laughs> the Wisconsin ice cap went through a number of oscillations, warm periods of ice recession, alternating with cold periods of ice readvance. Horberg is at a loss to see what could cause them to occur at the velocity requ required by the radiocarbon dates. These seem to require an annual movement of the ice front of 2,005 feet, two to nine times greater than the rate indicated by varves and annual moraines. The fact that these new data call into question some basic ideas in geology is recognized by Horberg. Quote, Probably only time and the process of future studies can tell whether we cling too tenaciously to the uniformitarian principle in our unwillingness to accept fully the rapid glacier fluctuations evidenced by radiocarbon dating. Recent geological literature shows that a rather desperate effort is being made to blur the significance of the new data. However, I would like to suggest some far-reaching implications. We have seen an ice sheet appear and disappear in, geologically speaking, a twinkling of an eye. There are three deductions to be made. A. Any theory of ice ages must give a cause that can operate that fast. B. If the last ice cap in North America appeared and disappeared in a short time, we cannot assume that the ancient ice caps lasted for longer periods. C. If other geological processes are correlated with ice ages, then their tempo must also have been faster than we have supposed, and a cause must be found for this accelerated tempo. Part 5. Conclusion. It is clear that none of the great glaciations of the past can be explained by the theories hitherto advanced. The only ice age that is adequately explained is the present ice age in Antarctica. This is excellently explained. It exists, quite obviously, because Antarctica is at the pole, and for no other reason. <laughs> That's good, yeah. No variation of the sun's heat, no galactic dust, no volcanism, no subcrustal currents, and no arrangements of land elevations or sea currents account for the fact. We may conclude that the best theory to account for an ice age 
is that the area concerned was at a pole. We thus account for the Indian and African ice sheets, though the areas once occupied by them are now in the tropics. We account for all ice sheets of continental, continental size in the same way. Stokes has provided an excellent list of specifications for a satisfactory ice age theory, every one of which is met by the assumption of crust displacements as the fundamental cause. A. There must be an initiating event or condition. B. There must be a mechanism for cyclic repetitions of os or oscillations within the general period of glaciation. C. A terminating condition or event. D. It should not rely upon unprovable, unobservable, or unpredictable conditions when well-known or more simple ones will suffice. E. It must solve the problem of increased precipitation with colder climate. And F. The facts call for a mechanism that either increases the precipitation or lowers the temperature very gradually over a period of thousands of years. So it is evident that a displacement of the crust can initiate an ice age by moving a certain region into a polar zone, while a later displacement could end the ice age by moving the same area away from the polar zone. Well, I see it as like, if you move a place into the polar zone, then you displace what was originally in the polar zone. That's right. That's what brings the yeah. ice further south, which cools everything. Yep. So you're or getting the north, whatever, whichever you're, side. Well, you're, you're at. yeah, whichever side. So, so if you shift the crust, the polar ice caps move towards the equator, and then the new regions at the poles begin to cool. Yep. And the regions away from the poles are warming up, but they're also cooling the rest of the climate. They're all yeah, and they're also all that melting can result can in result enormous in amount of precipitation. precipitation. Yeah. At the same time that it's cooling. Yes, yeah. that's right. I'm buying it. <laughs> <laughs> so the increased precipitation and oscillations of the borders of the ice sheets can be explained by the atmospheric effects that would result from volcanism associated with the movements of the crust. And these effects will be discussed in later chapters. So, but I mean, to accept this idea, I mean, he must be willing to accept then that there was a crustal shift as recently as 11,000 years ago. Yeah. He thinks there were, I think he said there was three in the last 30,000 years. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there, cause you have the, you know, the, the LGM, yep. the late glacial maximum, and then the gradual melting of that. So there's like the shift of those polar regions down or away from the poles, so you, you've got this gradual melting while you're accumulating new ice in the new polar region. Yep. And then another shift that causes it to rapidly regrow what we what we look at as regrow, which is just the movement of that ice into the down. <laughs> yeah. That newly grown ice down into the. Uh, yeah, know, I don't. I, yeah, I don't know. So the younger Dryas would have been essentially that. It's like like a crustal shift which makes it appear as though the ice suddenly grew back over all this area when really it was just moving it away from the polar area and the new pole accumulating more ice. Yeah. I don't know yet. We haven't, we haven't gotten to where I'm he... I'm working it out. All right, you're working I'm it out. I'm trying to figure it out. Okay. We're only in chapter two. I'm just... You have I, no idea what's going to happen. I'm just plugging in these ideas <laughs> into okay. what I, you know, have learned. All right. <laughs> All right, let's take another break. All right. That's the end of the book report for this episode. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll be right back with uh, stories and ramblings. Yeah. Welcome back. Final segment of Brothers of the Serpent podcast here. Uh, got some news stories. Do we have any? Uh, we got farm update. 
Um, just making wine. Did we say that we uh, racked all that stuff and everything? I don't know. I we pressed remember. it. It's been 17 hour. Yeah, I pressed. think we did that. Yeah, we did yeah. that. Yeah. Well, we racked it recently. Yeah, we did that last week. So yeah, that's right. Because then, because then, because you basically rack it off the, and I did the gross to play video games. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rack it off the gross leaves, which is the stuff that falls out right after you press. That was fun. Yeah. Not nearly as tough a job as the pressing. Um, just to pump over. You know, lots of tank shuffling, and we were working in confined quarters. But Yeah. And then I single-handedly pressed the Merlot oh, by myself through a tiny little press. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Had to get creative. It was fun. It was great yeah, it was a being able match. to do some wine work without Kyle there trying to boss everybody around and pretending <laughs> he knows what's going on. I got to make all the decisions. And when I left, See? I was like, well, if this is screwed up, it's totally my fault. <laughs> there's no, you know. Yeah, blame it on Kyle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, this is, I guess, screwed up 40 gallons of Merlot all by myself. <laughs> so. Yeah, and I, I got... Uh, 290 gallons of uh, Trebbiano juice came mm. in from the High Plains that I went. Um, we're making that over at uh, West just Cape. Just the juice? Yeah, just juice. So mm. they harvested the fruit, they pressed it, and then they cold settled it. Ah. And then we basically, so cold settling is like, you know, you're waiting for the little grape particles and stuff to fall out. It's basically the same thing we yeah. did with the wine, except this is just juice. Right. So it was just clean juice it looked real clear i tested it uh did some acid additions and then started the fermentation all right and i forgot to pull out 15 gallons for mom oh i got her that tank you're supposed to give her 15 gallons of that juice 15 oh, gallons and yeah well i guess she'll have forgot, to get so her own yeah i'm in, i'm in the market for 15 gallons of white <laughs> grape juice if anybody's got any <laughs> it's supposed to do that for mom totally forgot <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I guess that's it. I, yeah. That thing. That's right. It's interesting too. We're, we're at the end of the summer. This is normally when, uh, in a regular year, stuff is sort of turning brown and whatever, but now it's the greenest it's been the yeah, whole cause summer because we've gotten rain. rain. Yeah. The river, the, the, the creek, Turtle Creek or the river by us is full. It's beautiful because we, while it was completely dry, we cleared out. We had some guys come in and dredge the bottom. Now it's they deep. excavated the bottom. Yeah, they saying. excavated it. Now it's deep and beautiful. I mean, it's just absolutely. It's going to be awesome. Yeah. Just put some fish in there. A couple hundred fish. Yeah. What about rock and roll? Uh, Any rock and roll news? Uh, kind of the same news. Um, You've added some stuff to the Patreon. I did do a little Patreon dump. Tied tie through in a, the original um, version of a turnum that he made mm. on his iPad. Ah. So he like recorded his gu acoustic guitar using the iPad microphone and stuff, and then yeah. and built the song on GarageBand. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's basically a bunch of software instruments, but it's really cool. Uh, we were, we were, you know, he was listening to it and he sent it to me and he was like, dude, just like listen to the end of this and it gets all tripped out. I put it in, in this episode. I put a portion okay. of it in this episode. In this episode. Yeah. Uh, really good creation. So he posted that on the, on the Patreon and then I put, um, I put some album art up there and actually. With some notations. Yeah. I put a bunch of, wrote a bunch of notes on the processional diagram to kind of make, you know, so people can try to understand it and then uh, wrote a bit about it and then also posted some pictures of the, of the front cover album art describing like elements of the geometry and why it's significant. So I think that's pretty cool. And then I posted a couple more songs, some draft versions of stuff that we're going to be working on for the next album up there. Boxed up memories and horizon. All right. Russ is rocking that gym bail, boxed up memories. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, should we tackle Space Weather News? Yes, sir. From spaceweather.com. Excellent. <laughs> Sunspot Genesis 
A new sunspot, AR3098, is rapidly growing in the sun's northern hemisphere, Ooh. more than quadrupling in size since today. NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory captured the region's dynamic growth, and rapid changes in the sunspot's core are destabilizing its magnetic field, increasing the chances of an explosive flare. A C5-class wow. flare this morning sent rivulets of plasma across almost half the solar disk and could herald stronger flares to come. So stay tuned. So that's what happens is that the that the sunspot like disrupts the magnetic field and then it explodes. It is a disruption in the magnetic field. Oh. I think I don't know. Yeah, that's a good is it is does it disrupt it or is it the disruption? I I don't know. But yes, there is a disruption. Blue Walker 3. SpaceX successfully launched the huge Blue Walker 3 communication satellite along with 34 Starlink satellites in September 10th at 9.20 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The Falcon 9 rocket placed Blue Walker 3 into a circular orbit at approximately 513 kilometer, kilometers in altitude, where some experts believe it could become one of the brightest objects in the night sky. Light pollution or celestial wonder? We hope to receive sighting reports soon. Current conditions, solar wind speed is 418.7 kilometers per second. The density is a low 1.97 protons per cubic centimeter. Sunspot number is 122. The neutron count is 4.1% above the space age average. And the KP index is 1, quiet. And the 24-hour max is 3, which is also quiet. And is your space for the news cool, cool. for the week. Artemis 1 mission, they fixed the leak. And hopefully we'll be launching in late September. All right. But we'll see. Uh, we'll see. So I've got some stories here. Uh, first one I just pulled up uh, during the break, um, which uh, is about the giant globs under the Earth's crust. And I think we should do this. And this is uh, uh, from ideas.ted.com. And I, I've never heard of this Ideas. source before. Ted. But yeah, Excellent. I'm assuming it, maybe it's related to TED Talks. <laughs> I don't know. Is there an ideas.bill.com? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the Amazing World That Scientists Are Uncovering Beneath the Earth's Crust is the title. This is May 24th of 2017. There are continents to explore right below our feet, including two giant blobs 100 times as tall as Everest. Here's how seismologist and geophysicist Ed Garnero is studying this unseen and largely uncharted territory. For most people, everything they know about the composition of Earth is what they were taught in elementary school, that our planet is made up of an eggshell-like crust over a thick mantle surrounding a super-hot core. In the last decade, scientists have made some super interesting and even strange or profound discoveries that can add detail to that picture. Among their recent subterranean findings are a river of liquid metal that moves more swiftly than the oh, tectonic plates. A river of metal. A river of metal. <laughs> I know the watcher wants it to be mercury. Um, these, okay, so... Uh, it also also discovered are bubbles at the crust mantle boundary, a new species of mineral also that is somehow capable of holding water hundreds of miles within the mantle. Chambers of magma, where rocks are heating up like popcorn and expelled. So these are some of the listing some of the discoveries, right. the newer discoveries. Watcher says it is linked to TED Talks. Okay. The website. Thank you, Watcher. Like the deep oceans, our planet's innards are extremely difficult to study. Since humans can't travel very far into the Earth, and certainly not the 3,963 miles to its core, investigation has largely depended upon the development of technology that can sense what lies below. The existence of tectonic plates was confirmed only around 50 years ago when sonar was used to map the ocean floor. Why is venturing below so difficult? For starters, the pressure. Just eight miles down, you'd feel the equivalent of 131 elephants of force pressing down on your head. I like this. This, <laughs> this is good. 131 elephants. What's that in T-Rexes? 131 <laughs> elephants in T-Rexes. We need it. 
And it's unbearably hot. The temperature at the bottom of the top layer of the crust is roughly 1,600 degrees Fahrenheit. That's breezy compared to the Earth's core, which is thought to be about 10,800 degrees. Huh. 108. Hmm. As hot as the surface of the sun. So far, the farthest down that humans have tunneled is 7.6 miles. Geophysicists use seismometers to see inside the Earth, similar to how X-rays see inside our bodies. We tend to think of Earth as fairly solid, except perhaps when hit by an earthquake. In reality, though, we live on chunks of crust that are constantly doing a dance that we can't feel, but scientists are always monitoring. For example, Phoenix, Arizona rises and falls by about 40 centimeters twice a day due to the sun's and moon's gravitational pulls. And Southern California has about 10,000 earthquakes a year, most a magnitude two or less. Each of these quakes and every rise and fall creates seismic waves that are recorded by instruments called seismometers. Like an x-ray machine, a seismometer assesses how energy moves through an object to infer what's happening inside that object. Right now, the global seismographic network has more than 150 seismic stations distributed throughout the world, while the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology, the IRIS network, includes over 250 stations. In 2016, Ed Garnero from Arizona State University School of Earth and Space Exploration, uh, and then they have in parentheses here a TEDx Manhattan Beach talk, an amazing look into the center of the Earth, and a team used to used this trove of seismological data to delve into an ongoing mantle mystery. For decades, geophysicists had observed seismic waves slowing down in two areas beneath the crust on roughly opposite sides of the Earth, one below the Pacific Ocean and the other below Africa. They discerned that the masses were huge, each the size of a continent, 100 times the height of Mount Everest and around 1,800 miles beneath the surface and they assumed the areas were extra warm, since unusually hot zones can cause waves to slow down. Garnero and his researchers were determined to find out more. They are the largest parts of our Earth that we have identified, but we know nothing about, he says. Garnero's team looked at the data and made a major discovery. The giant blobs are not just a different temperature from the rest of the mantle, The researchers think they have a distinctly different chemical composition, too. We see from the seismic waves that go near the boundaries of the blobs that they split into a wave that goes into the blob and slows down, while a wave that continues along the blob's outside margin goes at normal speed, Garnero says. Scientists believe temperature alone cannot do that, so the blobs being compositionally distinct is the easiest explanation. Researchers don't know what the blobs are made of yet, but they can tell that the masses are denser and more stable than what's around them, and they're most likely feeding volcanoes. On Earth above the blobs, there are volcanoes past and present, from small to massive, Carnero says. For example, the hotspots that formed Hawaii, Samoa, and Iceland are all fed by extremely deep plumes of magma that appear to be connected to the blobs. Which leads to the question, where did these blobs come from? One intriguing theory is that they're leftovers from our planet's formation, remnants of some primordial layer of the Earth that eroded away over billions of years through the power of convection. Oh, the convection theory is still Mm -hmm. gone. Yep. (coughs) Our core cooks the mantle rock, which makes up about half of the Earth from below, causing it to slowly turn and move, Carnero says. If you did a time lapse of millions of years of Earth's rocky mantle, you'd see it swirl around just like smoke moving around a bonfire. And perhaps some of the material was swirled into forming the continent-sized blobs. Garnero and his team have used the seismic data to construct intriguing images of the Earth that include the mantle blobs, essentially giving us an MRI of our planet. Garnero wants to share with the public the thrill of searching inside the Earth. Recently, he said, recently, he and a group of artists from Arizona State University, led by Lance Garavi, created Beneath a Journey Within, 
which is a film, music, dance performance designed to immerse the public in seismic data. <laughs> Carnero says the cross-disciplinary collaboration has been exhilarating. <laughs> the scientists give the artist a platform to create, and then the artists give the scientists a new way to see their data. <laughs> Sorry. Well. Yeah, that took a sharp turn into something <laughs> weird. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh my gosh, they, men they mentioned a bass player. The performance, which featured artists including a bass playing geophysicist interacting with his data through trip hop bass lines and a belly dancing theoretical astrophysicist <laughs> embodied a seismic waves, is being held inside a 3D theater on campus. Oh no. My goodness, interpretive dance. <laughs> Okay. Yes, that did take a strange turn. <laughs> yeah. I will do more vetting, and I will look into these blobs some more, because I know that there's other interesting stuff. Anyway. Uh, well, that That's what the, happens when you cold read. That gave the basic details. <laughs> the basic <laughs> details. <laughs> okay, so... Shifting topics here. Unless the convection currents are originating from the tops of those blobs, it seems difficult to imagine the convection going through them. Through and, them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know. That was 2017, too, so I, I'm sure that there's... I feel like it's been since 2017 that I've done some stories on those yep. blobs. Yep, There's some really interesting stuff about them, too, so I just... I don't know. Uh, I'll, I'll find some more for, for another show. However, what I have today for the rest of this, my, my news stories, is a research on fusion, which has been a recent rabbit hole that I've been going down. So uh, I saw this pop up this past week. Uh, well, actually, maybe it was yesterday. This is from fizz.org. Yesterday is included in this past week. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. Unless your start of the week is Sunday. Uh, researchers generate fusion at 100 million Kelvin for 20 seconds. A team of researchers affiliated with multiple institutions in South Korea working with two colleagues from Princeton University and one from Columbia University has achieved a new milestone in the development of fusion as an energy source. They generated a reaction that produced temperatures of 100 million Kelvin and lasted for 20 seconds. So what's the milestone? The temperature? The, I think it's the length of time. Because we've, last time we were looking into this, I think the China, they had maintained it for 17 minutes or something. Oh. Or maybe this is a different... Maybe it is the temperature and, and duration. I'm not sure. Well, let's continue. In their paper published in the journal Nature, the group describes their work and where they plan to take it in the next few years. For the past several years, scientists have been trying to create sustainable fusion reactions inside power plants as a means of generating heat to, for conversion to electricity. Despite significant progress, the main goal has still not been met. Scientists working on the problem have found it difficult to control fusion reactions. The slightest deviations lead to instabilities that prevent the reaction from continuing. The biggest problem is dealing with the heat that is generated, which is in the millions of degrees. Materials could not hold plasma that hot, of course, so it is levitated with magnets. Two approaches have been devised. One is called an edge transport barrier. It shapes the plasma in a way that prevents it from escaping. The other approach is called an internal transport barrier, and it is the kind used by the researchers working at Korea's superconducting Tokamak Advanced Research Center. Yeah. It works by creating an area of high pressure near the center of the plasma to keep it under control. The researchers note that the use of the internal transport barrier results in much denser plasma than the other approach, and that is why they chose to use it. A higher density, they note, makes it easier to generate higher temperatures near the core, it also leads to lower temperatures near the edges of the plasma, which is easier on the equipment used for containment. In this latest test at the facility, the team was able to generate heat up to 100 million Kelvin and to keep the reaction going for 20 seconds. So that it must be the combination of the two. Yeah, and you can imagine that, you know, the kind of magnets that they're having 
to use to do this kind of uh, containment are superconducting magnets, and superconducting things have to be cold. So this is a difficult problem. You ju you've got something that you need to keep really cold next to something that is incredibly hot. <laughs> right. I'm pretty sure that's part of the problem. Yeah. So, yeah, they, they, they explain here. Other teams have either generated similar temperatures or have kept their reactions going for a similar amount of time. But this is the first time that both have been achieved okay. in one reaction. Yeah. The researchers next plan to retrofit their facility to make use of what they learned over the past several years of research, replacing some components such as carbon elements on the chamber walls with new ones made of tungsten, for example. So just an update on the hot... Phys uh, the what? hot fusion, hot fusion physics, and when I read this, I, I was thinking at the time, like it just reminded me. You know, I was thinking about cold fusion. It reminded me of sonoluminescence. Oh yes. <clears throat> so, sonoluminescence is probably explained in this story, but I'll give a brief synopsis. It's where you like they they'll take a, a liquid. And they'll surround the liquid with like a container. They'll surround it with um, tone generators, typically in the ultrasonic range, and create a standing wave pattern inside the liquid that's basically oscillating between extremely high pressures because of the standing wave of the ultrasound and normal pressures. And then they'll trap a bubble in there and the standing wave is basically holding that bubble in place, but also collapsing it and expanding it over and over, you know, very rapidly, as rapid as the as the um, the frequency of sound that they're using. So it makes it really hot inside yeah. this tiny little bubble, and, and it will it light gives up. off a lot of light. Yeah, yeah. it lights up. Um, and I remember reading of some of the incredible temperatures that were achieved when the some guy. Did yeah, but this, weren't those like fifty thousand? Yeah, it was. I don't, I don't remember exactly, but it was. Like, what is a what is a those, those? Well, he used he used like a liquid. What was it like? Xenon mm. or neon? Some kind of liquid, some other liquid than water, and put it in a cylinder that he dropped. Like you drop the cylinder. Yeah. And when it hits the ground, that's when it creates the shock wave inside, and they measured the temperature. Anyway, I was like, man, I wonder if this has any applications in cold fusion. And lo and behold, there are scientists who think that there might be a connection. So this is from uh, physics.aps.org. Plasma extremes seen through gas bubble. A gas bubble in a liquid becomes a plasma and emits emits intense flashes of light when squeezed by sound waves, a process called sonoluminescence. Researchers continue to puzzle over the phenomenon, but now a team reporting in physical review letters shows that a sonoluminescing bubble can serve as a test bed for theories of dense plasmas in astrophysical settings and nuclear fusion experiments. Mm. The team measured the bubble's response to lasers at two wavelengths in order to distinguish among plasma theories and to measure the free electron density. Of course. What? I'm just... Lasers, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, if the next step for a yeah, mad scientist shoot is it, shoot it shoot with it lasers. With a laser. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I know. <laughs> oh, wow. It does something cool. All right. Let's, let's try doing that and hitting it with a laser yeah. at the same time. <laughs> Um, the results confirm that a bubble in a room temperature liquid can produce a plasma that is nearly as dense as those used in fusion research. Mm. Wow. Sonoluminescence has been studied for 80 years and is now well controlled in laboratory settings. A gas bubble surrounded by liquid and pounded by sound waves produces a flash of light during each sound wave cycle. At the point of maximum compression, the gas in the bubble reaches a temperature of around 10,000 Kelvin. 10,000 Kelvin. Which is hot enough to ionize the gas, at least partially. The freed electrons deflect off atoms or ions, causing them to emit photons in a, pico, in a picosecond long flash of light, a process called thermal bremsstrahlung. <laughs> Are you sure that's how you say that? <laughs> Brimstrahlung. 
It's, it, I think it's German. The bubble collapse, which concentrates the energy of the sound waves a trillion fold, resembles the laser induced implosions of fuel pellets in inertial confinement fusion experiments. ICF. Uh, oh, okay, okay. Inertial confinement fusion, ICF. Okay. Experiments in ICF produce much hotter plasmas, millions of degrees, but they suffer from instabilities that allow energy to leak out. Sonoluminescence, by contrast, creates spherically symmetrical plasmas thousands of times per second that are stable for days at a time, offering an opportunity to study a manageable system at the jumping off point to fusion, says Seth Putterman at the University of California, Los Angeles. Okay. So in addition to studying the sonal luminescence effect for its own sake, Putterman and his colleagues have now begun to probe the plasma inside the bubble to better understand other plasmas in a similar range of density and temperature. Putterman and his colleagues have developed a technique for focusing laser pulses onto a sonoluminescing bubble and recording both the scattered laser light and the bubble flash. In a previous experiment investigating 100 micrometer wide bubbles in phosphoric acid, the team measured strong absorption by the bubbles, implying a high density of free electrons. I wonder if they should do this with heavy water. Mm. Like, let's get them all going, right? Let's do let's do sonoluminescence inside a beaker of heavy, heavy water, water with the, with the palladium t- and yes. iridium yeah, yeah, yeah. probes. So we get cold sonoluminescence. Yeah, so you're fusion. like you're like yeah, you get the this process going. You've got this hydrogen absorbing stuff, and then you start smashing the bubble inside of it at the same time. And then you shoot lasers at it. And you shoot a laser at it. (laughs) And you could suspend the whole thing in liquid mercury. Okay. And spin it. Wow. (laughs) Warp speed. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So anyway, the story goes on. It's just, I I just, I yeah, I, I love all these, like, you know, I think there is something to the combination of these various different yeah. phenomena and they're, you know, like, like utilize this, like, this is a really easy way to get plasma at 10,000 degrees Kelvin. Let's, let's start there. That's kind of what and the it's guys stable. Think. And it's stable. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And it's, con- yeah, and it's contained in room temperature water. Mm-hmm. Or, you know acid whatever they're yeah, using yeah, yeah let's put really yeah why were they using the acid <laughs> i don't know it's interesting that you can do i guess it's tiny so it, it isn't going to make the liquid boil or whatever i mean yeah where does that temperature where does the heat go does it get dispersed into liquid does the, the overall liquid uh, container the vat or whatever slowly heat up over if it's stable over what he said days, then yeah, it seems like you could do it, and, and you should and, be able to continually like oh yeah, cool cycle, the liquid, right? cycle the liquid, yeah, yeah, put it on. You a... don't want it moving too much. How are you going to maintain that bubble in there? I don't know. Maybe I well don't the, know the the process. Yeah, I'm sure you probably don't want the liquid flowing too much, but um, the hot liquid would go to the top, mm. so you could. So it's going to make it a convection. You could run the the hot liquid off the top and then feed it back into the bottom when it's cooled down. That's going to move the liquid. I mean... Yeah, but the bubble is being held in place by... The, by the sound waves. By the three-dimensional standing waves. Okay. So that it's like you you can't... You have to put speakers on three axes. Yeah. So that the waveform is actually creating like a little, a little box. Yeah. Right? That it's holding that air bubble in. Right. And I think it's way stronger than a little flowing liquid. Okay. But I could be wrong. No? I've always wanted to do that experiment too, man. The son- sonoluminescence one. I need to, I want to buy some, um, I want to buy some really good ultrasonic tone generators. Yeah. Or at least one that can generate multiple tones at once, right? I was also thinking that it would be great to have that kind of tool when we go to Egypt because, you know, if you could if you could use ultrasound or infrasound to do measuring, then they wouldn't know you were doing it because they couldn't hear it. Like, they get really mad at people who do toning. Yeah, exactly. You know, so you walk in there and you go, oh, mm, mm, and they get all, they get bent out of shape that you're doing that. Yeah. 
So if you could use like infrasound and ultrasound. Yeah. Be dude. silent. I'm all about it. <laughs> yeah. But I, I'm, I know that's a different direction than where you were still taking the, it, the, the, the machine, like a good g tone generator, probably like they'd look at that thing and w take one look at it and be like, nope. <laughs> yeah. It's too sciencey. <laughs> yeah. That looks real sciencey, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. Yeah. You're probably right. I was like, no, that 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 that's just to help me sleep at night. And I just I plug it in and I put yeah, and put this thing over here and it it helps me sleep. <laughs> right, it's a medical device. Why are you bringing that into the box? <laughs> well, well, I carry it with me. I was just, going to take a nap in the box. It's been stolen from hotel rooms before. Right, right. So I just keep it with me at all times. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's it for this week. Man, time flies in the cube. Time does everybody. fly. So there will be more. So, yeah, there's a couple of announcements here. There will be more Path of the Pole, although I'm not sure that next week is going to be Book Report. We'll see. It's either going to be Book Report or it might, might be something else. Just depends on what happens. And then after that, I'm going to be in the Scablands. So, and I'll be there for two weeks. Kyle's going to be there for the second week. So, so maybe, yeah, there will be, uh, you know, stuff from that, but I, I don't know if we're going to, I'm not planning on doing shows while we're gone. Okay. So no road. So there going to be a road. So there could be, I mean, you know, yeah, that's what I was road. saying there, whatever material is published from then is going to be from there. So yeah. 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 That's what I mean. Not regular episodes. Um, so, but the path of the pole will continue uh, after we get back from the Scablands, for sure. Which is October 1st. Yeah. When we get back. Right. That's right. And, you know, I've noticed this, uh, there's this interesting trait, like with the new, uh, with the move from the way we published the show in the old days to the new, you know, Libsyn, the Liberated Syndication uh I've got like statistics and I've noticed this interesting thing that with book reports, the first episode of any given book report always has the most downloads and or views or whatever. And then it slowly goes down from there as people peel away from the diving down into the rabbit hole. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> you can't handle this. That's truth. right. People, more and more people find out that they can't handle it. And then, and then when we start the next book report again, you get bam, the most, and then it peel, they peel off. So it's like by the time you get to the end of the book report, you've got only the dedicated deep divers with <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are the ones that really stick it through to the end. We're really going to trash all you people that bail out in the last <laughs> yeah, episode yeah. Oh, of yeah. this book report. Oh, we've already had, like, this, like those of you who have stuck it through to part two are already part of a group of people who didn't bail out. That's right. Because I guarantee you that's... You're not getting trashed. <laughs> that's right. Yet. Yet. <laughs> Until you bail out on the third episode. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, you just, you'll never hear it. You'll never hear us trashing you because you haven't bailed out if you're listening. Just know that it's happening. Right. If you bail out, you know that you're getting trashed in the next episode that you didn't listen to. Yeah. <laughs> if you wake up and find yourself nailed to the wall, <laughs> that's, uh, that's us. I couldn't listen to Path of the Pole Part 14. <laughs> you bailed out. You got trashed. All right. You guys can get a hold of us, Brothers of the Serpent at gmail.com. Check out the website, Brothers of the Serpent.com's got all the podcast related stuff, including the way to support the show. You can do that. Join the pyramid scheme. Send us straight to pyramids with the donations of any amount you choose through PayPal, or you can sign up to the Patreon uh, with monthly do donations and also get Patreon content. I have been posting the bumper tunes there, full the full, if there are, full editions of the bumper tunes. Uh, and there's also the occasional extra episode that Kyle and I will publish there. So there's, if you sign up to the Patreon, you can get all of that. Um, and there's other things too, like videos of Kyle hunting for artifacts and just, you know, just cool stuff on the Patreon. So support the show. Thanks to all of you who do that. Uh, we really appreciate it. You can also join the discord. Uh, we got a big team of mods that help run the place. And Jeff, uh, our buddy Jeff over there has, uh, really contributed to the discord the most. He built it. Uh, oh, and we do have a 
Yeah, we have an executive producer. We have an executive producer. Fantastic. Uh, Michael Hale is the executive producer of this show. Thank you very much. Thank you. 100 bucks. Yes, thank you so much. Put you in the credits. You will be in the credits. Thank you so much. Send me the screenshot. Will do. Right now. Uh, yeah, so join the Discord. That's a lot of a lot of people in there hanging out, talking about all kinds of subjects that we discuss on the podcast and more. You know, there's a there's a bunch of channels. There's a lot of good discussion going on in there all the time. So if you want to, uh, you know, connect with like minded people that also listen to the show, sign up at the Discord. You got to be able to pass the test though to get in. Just warning you, you got to pass it's the test. Really tough test. <laughs> That's it for this week, folks. Thank you so much. We love you guys. Always have. Always will. Good night, Adamu. Get back to work.